dive deep today and see how we can provide value to everybody who's listening and really just get them more success, more happiness, more life. But for those who don't know who you are, I guess I really want to just start this off with an introduction. And usually I give the intro, but I noticed that uh, when you booked this and you put in the the intro, you mentioned uh, right here, you said, a guy who's trying to change the way that people think. Yep. I want to dive deeper into this. What did you mean by this? Well, I think that a lot of people overcomplicate life. And I think it's actually pretty simple. I think that if you do the things that you set out to do, your life starts to feel a little bit easier. If you live life uh, as some would put it on expert mode uh, and you and you try your hardest to do the most difficult things, the things life present you feels a lot easier. And so I think that if people expose themselves to more challenging stuff and push themselves and actually did the things that they say they were going to do, there wouldn't be as much mental illness in the world. There wouldn't be as much uh, despair, nihilism, um, anxiety, everything that seems to be mainstream at this point. And, uh, I think 99.9% of the battle is just that people have an expectation of what their life is supposed to be, the person that they want to become. And they're not doing the things that are required to get there. Mm. And I think that if they just do that, then uh, they're going to feel a lot better about not only their current situation, but life as a whole. I love that. So let's take it back. How do you actually change the way that, that you think and where did you start from? What was the zero to hero story in terms of actually changing how you thought? Yeah, well, I'm not sure about a hero at this point. I'm I'm working on getting getting there. But um, yeah, so I, I like to say that I was a product of the modern world. I thought like just about how everyone else thinks. And that is you are confined to a certain reality. Uh, your genetics uh, predetermine your destiny and you, it doesn't matter what you do to some degree that you will not achieve, uh, what you want to. And that if you feel depressed, if you feel anxious, if you feel, uh, a certain way, then the way to make that feeling go away is to numb it, is to escape it, to run from it, to, indulge in things such as Netflix and video games and social media and whatever other nonsense the world has to distract us. And that's how, that's, that's how my brain operated uh, at the time. I did basically what the Western world tells you to do when you have anxious, when you, when you are anxious, when you are depressed, and that is to take medication and go to therapy, which Mm -hmm. I did. I was on antidepressants and I went to therapy every single week and that did not help my situation at all. And I'm not going to sit here and say that it is never helpful. It it never does anything, but in my scenario, and I think the scenario of many other people, uh, it doesn't help. And I think the reason for that is it is over prescribed. It is over, uh, fewer people actually have these diseases than what society would lead you on to believe. And so, the problem really is, is that people have an expectation of what reality is supposed to be, and their actual reality is not living up to that, and they can't figure out why. And I was no different. And so what had happened was 2020 rolled around. Obviously, we had the pandemic. We had other issues that in any other year would have been the would have been the event of the year, but it seemed to just be another day in 2020. And uh, a lot of things rose to the surface and I started doing a little digging and found out that things aren't things aren't as they appear. And one of the things that I realized that we were lied to is what we should prioritize in life. You grow up, you go through school and they tell you that you should focus on being happy. You should focus on... Uh, pleasure. You should focus on doing what feels good. 
Mm. And I found that the complete opposite is actually what you should be pursuing because every single time I did the harder thing, the thing that I didn't want to do, the thing that I knew was going to be best for me in the long run, I ended up being much happier in the short term. I ended up feeling much more accomplished, much more confident. And I took and I'm still taking that theory to its logical conclusion and only doing things that I find challenging, only doing difficult things, only doing things that I know that are going to be better for me in the long run. And that's not to say that I don't enjoy myself or relax or spend time with family. Like, obviously I do those things, but I don't do them at the expense of the things that are going to make my life better. I love that. Yeah. So why do you, why do you think society is pushing meds society's pushing therapy society's pushing doing what just feels good and not dealing with the actual root of the problem do you think it's just that they don't know and they haven't tested these things or do you think that there's a deeper reason for that i like to think that there's a deeper reason for it i think that i think that certain governing bodies certain authority figures in the world would like to retain that authority, retain that power. And the way to do that is to create a generation and generations of individuals that are not self-governing, that they mm. they don't have authority over themselves. They can't control their behavior. And humans are fundamentally uh, flawed beings. We have, we have biases, we have desires, we have, uh, we have, you know, We have many, 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 many flaws, and we have to have our behavior governed by something, right? We can't just act like animals; otherwise, we we everything falls apart. This whole civilization thing that we built does not sustain itself. And so, if we understand that we have to govern our behavior to some degree or that something has to govern our behavior, that's either going to come from another person, such as your parents or your wife or your, um, I don't know, just somebody else. It's going to come from the government or it's going to come from yourself. Mm. So you can either choose to become someone that governs themselves by cultivating discipline and cultivating cultivating, um, fortitude and being responsible and and taking care of the things that need to get done and putting putting your duty to others before uh before your own personal preferences uh or you can put your own preferences first and become a slave to your desires in which case Mm -hmm. your uh behavior is going to need to be governed by an external force because you can't govern it yourself because you are a complete slave to any impulse that enters your brain and then something's going to swoop in and control that behavior for you. And that's going to be in the form of more than likely a governing body, such as the United States government, if you live in the U.S. or wherever you live. Um, it's, just the nat- it's just natural law. If there's chaos or order has to be there to balance it out. And so you can either order yourself or have someone else order, order yourself for you. Love that. So for people who want to take back control, of themselves, of their bodies, of their habits, of their mind, so that they're not just giving into all of these impulses. What's the first pillar? What's the first step? Is it that they need to focus on getting fit? Is it that they need to focus on their mind? Is it that they need to focus on their values? What's the very first thing in their control that they can actually implement? So the first thing that I would say is that you should audit your entire life and identify the things that could be better that you could, that you actually could make better, Mm -hmm. right? What areas of your life suck and what can you do about them to make them better, right? If you are, if you have poor relationships because you don't have any social skills, well, that's something to work on. If you have poor relationships because you are you have a habit of holding on to grudges, well, that's something you should work on. If you are broke because you don't have a work ethic or you don't you don't have any skills, well, that's something you should work on. Um, if you are completely overweight 
because you can't control the things that you put in your body or you're too lazy to get off the couch and burn some calories, well, that's something you need to work on. So when in any area of your life, there's there are things you can do to make them better and you need to identify those things. So that's the very first thing. And then once you've identified what areas are broken and what you can do to make them better. And I'm not saying fix them. Everyone thinks that I mean like fix, like make it all perfect. That's not the point here. The point here is not the 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 destination. It is the it is the process of just making things a little bit better. And mm-hmm. that's part of it too, is is managing expectations about how quickly this stuff is going to happen because everyone you know, a business is an example or workouts are an example, right? People want to start a business and be a millionaire on Saturday. People want to start a workout program and have a six pack by next week. That's not how it works. Just focus on getting a little bit closer in any event. Identify the things that are wrong with your life. Figure out what you can do tangibly, what action steps you can take to improve them, even just a fraction of a percent. And then every single night before you go to bed, write those action steps down, wake up the following day and don't go to bed until you complete them. And then Mm -hmm. repeat that process seven days a week. I love that. So just having non-negotiables where you don't negotiate with your own mind. It's like, I have to complete these no matter what time of the day it is. I won't sit there and think, oh, well, I'll do this tomorrow. It's like, these are the non-negotiables that it must be completed as if my life depended on it. Exactly. Like there's no... In, in no universe are you going to regret making your relationships better, your body better, your bank account better, your, your uh, family life better. You're not going to regret doing these things. And so if you can identify that these action steps that you're taking are objectively beneficial to your life, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't be taking mm-hmm. them seven days a week. And there's no, at no point should you stop doing them because what people do, right? They say, I'm going to start this diet until I get a six pack. I'm going to start this business until I'm a millionaire. It's like, stop focusing on the result. If you can identify that the the action steps that are required to get from A to B are objectively beneficial for your life, you should be, you should be dedicated to completing them for the rest of your life. Love that. Yeah. It's almost like the person who says, well, I'm going to make a bunch of money before I get a personal trainer and I get fit and all this stuff. It's like, well, that's in your control right now. So for yourself, personally, right? As you were going through this journey, trying to get back control of your mind, what were some habits that you started to incorporate for yourself? And what were some habits that you had to start to remove? Yeah. So my, I think my story is much less about what I've implemented and more about what I've removed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because I've always, uh, to some degree, I've always had a, a, a work ethic. I've always like, as soon as I got out of high school, like I immediately started working in a job and I started advancing and I was, you know, I'm a work guy. I've always been that way. I've always liked working on stuff and completing projects and building. Like that's what I've always done. Um, I've been creating content for 14 years. So like, I just do it for fun. And um, so that I never struggled with, but the problem was I was distracted I had distractions that were changing my behavior. I was playing too many video games, consuming too many, too many, uh, you know, TV shows and movies and content online and all this other nonsense. I just became a, a serial consumer and I was just completely distracted. So in order to regain that work ethic, I had to cultivate boredom. I had to put myself in a position where I had to, I mean, like, what where do the best ideas? come from they they come when you're in the shower or you're doing something where you can't be sitting there scrolling on your phone right Mm -hmm. where your mind is not stimulated and so for me like in order to get my brain working again in terms of like thinking deeply and being creative i had to get rid of whatever distractions were were deviating me or deviating my attention to to away from what i should be focusing on so that was the first thing the next thing was weed marijuana like that was something that completely killed my my motivation because and nobody wants to talk about this right everyone wants to talk about how how weed is like god's greatest gift to the earth and it's a and it's a medicine and like whatever you know like cool whatever but there's no disputing that it makes everything interesting right even the most boring things that have no business being considered interesting are considered interesting when mm. you're high like that's just it's just a fact 
you know, when I do things now that I used to find super stimulating and interesting when I was high, I'm completely bored by. And that's a dangerous thing because boredom is useful. You, boredom creates creativity. Boredom creates innovation. It creates deep thought. And when everything is interesting, you know, your, your, your bar for life becomes a lot lower. You know, mm. you don't, you don't try to achieve anything because all the dopamine that you'd receive from, a, from, from making achievements in the world, you get by just sitting there and watching a TV show because you're high. Right. right. So that was something that I had to eliminate from my life completely. I don't do it anymore. Um, and so those, those were kind of the two main things that were holding me back was just like too many distractions in terms of like video games and social media and content and weed that just made everything far too interesting. Mm. And then in terms of things that I've implemented, there's two main things, physical fitness, which is something I've always been interested in. But of course, as, as with my work ethic, I just got distracted. I just got, and, and the munchies certainly didn't help. <laughs> But, you know, and so I fell off the rails in fitness when I was, you know, because before I was a boxing trainer, I, I was in shape. I, had, I was like 170 pounds, like I was chilling. Then I ballooned up to 240 pounds and I had to get my, my fitness back. So that's what I, that's one of the things that I implemented was getting back to lifting weights, getting back to getting in shape. And to me, that's the foundation of everything. Like fitness is the, is the, is the lens that you see the world through. And so if your, if your physical health is like murky and mucky and gross and not as good as it could be, everything else that you do is going to suffer because of it. You're going to be a poor, you're going to be a worse father, a worse brother, a worse son, a worse husband, a worse everything, employee, boss, business owner, uh, whatever, right? You have to make sure your physical health is in check because everything that you do passes through that filter. And the other thing is um, two, well, it's kind of two things in one. It's the power list and 75 hard. So if I'm not, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with uh, Andy Frisella, he's a CEO mm -hmm. and founder of First Form. He's also the host of the Real AF podcast. And I'm very fortunate to call a friend of mine. And so he created a, a program called 75 Hard, which is basically a mental toughness program where it is, you do two 45 minute workouts a day. One of them has to be outside. You drink a gallon of water a day. You read 10 pages of a nonfiction personal development book every single day. And then you uh, take a progress picture every day. You have, to, you have to do all of these tasks or you have to follow a diet as well and no alcohol. You have to do all, all of these tasks consecutively for 75 days. And this is a, this is a, I don't know if you want to call this a habit or a collection of habits or a program, whatever you want to call it. But when I, when I outline the protocol or of, of the, the how of how I went from who I was to who I am now, 75 hard was the program. Like 75 hard is what I did in order to, in order to cultivate the the discipline in order to to um get where i am now now the reason that program works is the more interesting thing because it it teaches you how to do all the things that i taught that i talked about at the beginning of this podcast doing the things you say you're going to do and building momentum right it teaches you how because the program is not lose a certain amount of weight get in physical get get a six pack you know read this amount of page. It's like, no, the goal of the program is to wake up every single day and do those handful of tasks that I just listed. That's the program. If you do those things, you succeeded. Great. And that is life. That is building anything. That is, you know, that's how it works. Success in 75 hard is success in life. And that's why it's so effective. So um, I also mentioned the powerless, which is goes hand in hand with 75 hard. It's basically just a task list. It's a to-do to list that helps you build certain habits. So you pick five critical tasks that you do every single day and they have to be critical tasks. I'm not talking about changing a light bulb or going and mowing the lawn or things that you would do anyway. I'm talking about like 
make a hundred cold calls for your business today, or make mm -hmm. five pieces of content, or um, you know, have a have a meeting with that one person that you're supposed to have a meeting with, like things that actually move the needle forward. So you pick five of those things and then you complete them before you go to bed. And that and as you once you've completed those things, you have quote unquote won the day. And I think this is very important for a couple of reasons. One, because it it creates momentum by doing things consecutively. Two, because you you understand the process of of just getting things done. And like you you it doesn't put any pressure on a result. It puts pressure on the actions, right? So once you've completed the tasks, you're done for the day. You can keep working if you want to, but you're done for the day. You had you won the day by your own metrics, by your own standards. You set the bar for what a successful day looks like and you completed it. Now, if you want to go hang out and chill, you can. And that's something that I abide by every single day. So some days I'm done with work by 10, 10 a.m. Other days I'm done with work by 10 p.m. It just depends on what the tasks are. But once I've once I'm completed, once I've completed the task, I can sleep knowing that I did what I was supposed to do today. And I think the problem with what most people, the problem with most people is they don't do that. They don't mm -hmm. do that. They just sit around and they they know they're supposed to do certain things, but they just choose to do other things instead. And then days and weeks and months go by and they've either completely let themselves go or they're exactly where they started in the first place. And that's something that I've experienced time and time and time again. And, you know, one of the things that I like to think about and say to myself and say to others is like, time's going to pass one way or another. The next year of your life is going to pass one way or another. So you might as well do the things you're supposed to do every single day of that year and see what happens. I love that. So for everyone who's listening, first get clarity of direction in terms of where your life needs improvement, what's going bad with your life. Remove the stuff that's not helpful. And challenge yourself with a list of non-negotiables, which creates momentum into a new person, right? Yep. So you mentioned removal being a huge part. Of, it was almost a base of everything that you did. So for everyone who's like, man, I need to remove a lot of things in my life. There is Netflix I need to remove. There's weed I need to remove. There's porn I need to remove. There's bad eating that I need to remove. There's all of these huge lists of things that I need to remove. Should they just remove it all at once? Or how do they prioritize the removal of bad habits? Yep. Um, well, it really depends on the type of person you are and where you're at, where you're at on your path. Mm. Because there's no one size fits all for this. But I think the I think most people listening to this will probably benefit from removing the most important things to remove uh first. So if your if your big thing is weed, then you have to get rid of that first. If your big thing is video games, then you have to you have whatever whatever is the biggest roadblock between where you are and where you want to be are the things that should go first. Mm. If 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 you, if drinking is something that you just do on the weekends and it's not that big of a deal and it's not going to make or break your success, and you have other things that are that are making or breaking your success, then keep drinking on the weekends until like you'll get there later. You'll get there at some point, but that's not a priority now. So eliminate the things that are the most detrimental to your success first, uh, and then work your way to the, to the less detrimental things. That's kind of what I did, but there are, there are certain people that they just reach a rock bottom and they just hit a certain point where they, they have the ability to just like completely go cold turkey on everything that sucks in their life. Uh, but I think that's a very small percentage of the population. I think to, to properly set expectations is to just go one thing at a time. And then you, you start to feel the momentum and the, 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 uh, the, the compounding effect of, of fixing and eliminating certain things. You know, if you, if you, for me, uh, weed was the first thing that was the, that was the, that was the stump, the domino that started the whole thing. And so I got rid of that. And then my focus was better. My mental clarity was better. I wasn't, I wasn't as interested in all the same things that I was. I wasn't as interested in video games because I wasn't high. And so video games being the next thing that went 
it was much easier to do that because I got rid of the thing that drew me to that in the first place. And then mm -hmm. once I stopped playing video games, you know, now my time's opened up and I got to focus on other things now. And so then I started working on my financial situation, right? Because now I'm not as distracted. I don't find these things as interesting. Now I'm going to focus on uh, fixing my bank account because I got nothing better to do. So, and then, you know, one thing happens after another and that it's kind of how it works. I love that. I feel like a lot of, uh, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and they have this all in or all out mentality. And so when they get tired of their life, they say, and this is what I used to do. I used to be like, screw it, all of it I'm getting rid of. And then you have this like band-aid effect, right? Or, or this uh, snap where it's just like you go all in and then boom, it snaps back. And uh, I think for me, the biggest change was finding the common denominators. Like what were the things that were just being triggered all the time? And for me, it was bad sleep. If like I had bad sleep, then I would end up drinking, then I would end up smoking, then I would end up watching porn. So I just fixed the bad sleep. And a lot of that stuff just kind of went away. So I, I love that. You mentioned um, boxing. How how much do you think martial arts, especially for men, but just for everyone, how much does a, does martial arts play a role into challenge, into kind of being that warrior, doing things that you're af afraid of or fearful of? Yeah, I mean, I, I, everyone should be doing martial arts. Everyone should be boxing. Everyone should be doing jujitsu because I think it teaches you uh, jujitsu to a certain degree uh, more so than the rest of them uh, because martial arts teach you all the things you need to learn about life in one place. Mm. It teaches you the discipline. It teaches you the physical aspect of staying in shape it teaches you to be humble because if you're not because martial arts is much about much more about skill than it is physical uh your physical attributes or your physical gifts especially in jujitsu like literally you being big and strong matters almost none in jujitsu unless you know how to use it then it actually matters quite a bit but um you know it it is the it is the great equalizer in my opinion because you have to go in it's kind of like the military, right? Like when you go into boot camp in the military, they shave your head, they put everyone in the same clothes, and then they basically strip you down. You were this person, now you're this person. Now you're a grunt. Mm -hmm. Now you are now you are this blank canvas and we are going to be rebuild you. And I think martial arts have the same sort of effect where you go in one person, especially if you have an ego and things you want to prove and all whatever. And then because you you're getting punched in the face and choked out and it actually requires skill in order to ex excel in this you are brought to your knees you 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 are completely humbled you are symbolically uh uh or metaphorically shaving your head and being put in the same clothes as everyone else because everyone has to start out as a white belt everyone has to start out the same and everyone has to learn all the same skills in the same order to to build themselves up into somebody that is competent at that thing and such is the case with everything else you're it, when you start out in business you're going to suck it's just the way it is you're going to suck at it and you're going to get marginally better every single time you make a cold call, every single time you have a sales call, every single time you have to fulfill your product or service, you're going to, you're going to get incrementally better at it. Um, you know, such as the case with making content, such as the case with basically any skill-based endeavor that you want to take on in life, all has those same things in common with, with martial arts. And I don't think you learn it anywhere more in a, in a much more pure sense than you do on a jujitsu mat in a boxing ring you know to me that to me it is it is the greatest teacher and there's also the byproduct of learning uh incredibly useful skills and building the confidence to defend yourself and uh, and be a, f a physical threat to uh, anyone that might pose a threat to you yeah, there's nothing like it. You just have a different air of confidence. I, I've been boxing since I was 16. So you walk into a room and versus someone else, not that you're comparing, you just have a different groundedness to you because you know you can handle anything. It's like I've I've been punched so much in the face 
that like nothing is going to necessarily scare me. One thing that I do have to overcome is I've tried jujitsu a couple of times and the sweat, man, the sweat is just a big factor for me. Just guys sweating on me and stuff. It was always hard to, to go back in there. Yeah. Well, it, there's a, there, you cross a certain threshold in jujitsu where um, you start to learn the game and it becomes less about the, you stop thinking about what's going on. Mm. You stop being conscious of these things and you're more focused on the tactics and, and, you know, how to get out of a certain position or how to gain an, an, an advantageous position. Um, you, you much more, you become much more focused on what's actually going on in terms of the, the actual situation you're in on the mat than you do, uh, than you do worrying about what someone smells like or whatever, right? Like, <laughs> It, yeah, it, it, it's a, it's something to get over and you just have, it just comes with reps, especially as you gain certain skill, right? Because one, when you first start out, it's about survival. It's about just like not getting choked out. Um, but once you start to develop a base level of skill and you start to be able to uh, put your own attacks together and, you know, defend certain positions and you start to learn certain escapes, um, you, you you start thinking about it more as a game than anything else. Mm. It's much more like chess than, than, uh, I don't know, rolling around with a sweaty guy. <laughs> right. Fair. I see you got a Jordan, uh, Peterson. What is that? A poster, a book, how important it's, it's, has... a, it's a signed poster. I love that. How important has he been to you? And in what ways? Um, I would say, well, he was the first person that, articulated the idea that life is not about vague happiness and being joyful all the time. Mm. Uh, he was the first person in my life that kind of uh, expressed that life is suffering and that you don't get to choose. You don't get to choose whether or not you suffer, but you get to choose what you suffer for. And that was extremely powerful in my life, obviously, because that's kind of what I say now. Um, but yeah, he's, he's in the, top three most influential men in my life period i love it so you got uh jordan peterson you said andy frisilla yep. who's the third my dad nice why why your dad how has he been so instrumental for you well my dad is not he was never the type of guy that pulled me aside and said here son let me show you how to do this but he led by example he mm. went to work every single day. He did everything around the house. He did everything he needed to do and didn't complain a single time. He demonstrated exactly what sacrificing for your family looks like. He demonstrated exactly what self selflessness looks like. And I say, I'm talking about him in the past tense as if he's not alive. He is alive. Um, but he, he still demonstrates these things every single day. Uh, he is, he is, the most stoic man that I know and um, to his own detriment sometimes because he'll be suffering in silence, even though he shouldn't be. Um, so he's not flawless, but he just, he gave me an example of what, what putting your family and God first looks like tangibly, you know, like he, he serves himself last. He makes sure oh, that man. everybody eats. He makes sure that everybody eats before him. He makes sure that everybody has what they need before he does. And he will, he will take the short end of the stick every single time. Yeah. It's crazy how much of a difference who your father figure is dictates sure. your life. Cause, cause I'm the same way. Like I've had a father who's very consistent and sacrificial almost to, to the family. And when you are not, living up to that potential you see that comparison where you're like man my father's doing this but yet here i am almost like wasting my potential for him bringing me into this world so it's amazing yep. so andy frisilla jordan peterson your father biggest i guess mentors to you what books outside of mentors have majorly impacted you um i think that there are three that come to mind how to win friends and influence people. I know everyone talks about that book and everyone cites that book. I just think it, I just think it properly 
illustrates the notion that life is a value exchange and that if you want to get, you have to give. And I see a lot of these guys on the internet, especially young guys who these are the types that want to do, you know, all these drop shipping and silly little businesses Mm -hmm. that they just want to get, they just want to take value. They want to extract value from the world and not give any themselves. And they have to understand that that's not the way the world works. It's not the way relationships work. It's not the way money works. It's not the way anything works. If you want to receive value, you have to give a disproportionate amount of value in in relation to the amount that you want to receive. If you want to if if you want to give if you want to receive ten dollars, you have to give a hundred dollars worth of value, right? Like it's just the way it works. Um, and so that's the first thing. And I think that te- the how to win friends and influence people best illustrates that. And I think that if everyone read that book, the world would, and actually implemented the lessons in it, uh, the world would be a much better place. Mm. Um, the second book is Can't Hurt Me from David Goggins. The, and I'm not going to give any gr- groundbreaking ba- books here. Um, these are uh, these are just the ones that I think changed my perspective the most, especially this one, because um, what I love about David Goggins is, I mean, you could look at Michael Jordan and say, that guy was different. You could look at Kobe Bryant and say that guy was different. You can look at, you could look at, I don't know, Elon Musk and say that guy is different. But you can't look at David Goggins and say that guy was different. Mm. Because David Goggins was the epitome of the fat, lazy loser that that everyone, you know, that 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 everyone thinks of, right? Like he was overweight. He had a shitty job. He had all the trauma that one can have. He dealt with racism. He dealt with all these things. And then he turned into David Goggins. And when you read that book and you fully understand just how horrible his life was growing up, and then you see who he is now, nothing will shift your perspective more in terms of how hard you think your life is and how possible becoming a better version of yourself feels Mm -hmm. after reading that. Because you think if David Goggins can go through all this, have all these disadvantages, having a learning disability, dealing with all these problems, watching his stepfather, not watching his stepfather get murdered, but having his stepfather get murdered, getting abused by his father, all these things, and then turning into the the toughest man on earth. It's like, I can probably get a little bit better myself, huh? Mm -hmm. I can probably improve a little bit. And the third book is The Way of the Superior Man. Great book. I don't don't know what about that book I find so interesting and so fascinating. I just think that a lot of people don't know how to deal with their masculine energy properly. Um, And I think that book really puts into words how to to best navigate the world as a man. And... uh, that was one book. I actually read that book for the first time fairly recently. And I read it three times in a row, three days in a row. Uh, Love that. It's just a fantastic book. So David Goggins, Can't Hurt Me, The Way of the Superior Man, and can't. Uh, what was the other one? How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yep. Love that. So I love, I love to ask this question. Imagine you're 60 and you come back now what advice do you think you would give yourself to make the next 10 to 20 years of your life very easy or not very easy, but accomplished, successful yeah. make the path easier? My 60 year old, I think it would be the advice that I give to my 18 year old self right now. And that is take the hard, take the path of most resistance mm. and give as much value to the world as you possibly can. I don't think if you do, if you do those two things, your life is going to end up in a bad place. If you give, if you, if you try to be of service to others and give everything you possibly can to the world and you do the most difficult things you can possibly do, I don't think you're going to end up in a bad place. I love that. And everybody who's listening as well, take the path of most resistance, not least resistance most resistance and give more value, give more instead of taking focus on giving instead of asking, instead of asking, what can I give? What can the world give me? Ask, what can I give the world? Because ultimately 
even if you never ask for anything ever, the world's just going to give you stuff if you give everything you have. If you there, if you become somebody that gives so much value to other people, oper, you're never going to not have an opportunity. Right. Ever. I love that. I like to ask these, uh, I call them rapid, rapid fire questions. So quickly, kind of like the first thing that kind of comes to your mind. What are three traits or words your friends or family would use to describe you? Um, I would say ambitious, hardworking, and uh, laid back. It sounds antithetical and uh, and <laughs> and like they don't go together, but they do. Like, if you know yeah. me, when I'm on, I am on. But when I'm off, I'm off. What are three positive traits that you want to incorporate more of into who you are? Um, three positive traits that I want to incorporate more. I would say... That's a tough one. That's a tough one. I really try to do my best to like walk the walk and be the best version of myself that I possibly can be. And fuck, that's tough. Let me think about that. I don't, I'm trying, I'm trying to not sit here in silence thinking about this, but. Or, or be more of, even be more of, not necessarily. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I would say, I would say, I don't know if this is a good answer. It's not, it's not three, but it's just like amplifying the traits that I'm already trying to exemplify, right? Like doing hard things. I, I feel like I just need to continue to do harder things like fighting tougher opponents, giving even more. Uh, cause it, cause as much as you try to embody certain traits, like you're going to fall short in some capacity. And I really do try. So I don't know if I would tr I would add in more. It's just like go even harder on the stuff that you're trying to do. You know, I love that. What What do you feel like is your greatest fear? Being on my deathbed and looking back at my life and realizing that I that I didn't even try. Mm. And another thing would be understanding the times that we're in and. Western society and Western culture and the United States and looking at this time in history and having my kids ask me, having my kids and my grandkids ask me what I did during this time and my answer be nothing. I love that. What do you, what is the last book that you read and why did you read it? So we talked about the best books that you've read, but what was the last one that you read? The last book that I read while well, I'm currently reading uh, Winning by mm -hmm. Tim Grover. And the last book that I read was, was Relentless by Tim Grover because I'm a friend of Andy's and Andy's a big advocate of Tim Grover. And he is, if you don't know who Tim Grover is, he was the personal trainer of both Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant and numerous other NBA players. And uh, he wrote two books, Relentless and Winning, and I had read neither of them. So I thought I should probably read these books. So that's that's why I read them. Good. What was the best quote that you've ever heard that absolutely change your mindset, your life, or how you operate even till this day? Unearned comfort knows no nobility. Unearned comfort knows no nobility. I love that. So the comfort that you have not even put in the work for is not noble. Yep. I love it. Does religion at all play a factor into your life or spirituality? And if so, in what way? And if not, why not? It didn't for a long time. But then I think uh, around 2020 is when I started to find spirituality a little more. Uh, well, I guess that's not true. So I was, I, was, I was raised Catholic. And then I left the church because they weren't giving me any good answers. They were trying to teach me the five-year-old version of Christianity. And I was a 16 year old that I think 
was asking questions that they didn't have answers to, mm. or at least the answers they were giving me, I didn't like. Um, I didn't, they, they, they didn't pack it. They packaged it up the wrong way in any event. So I became like an atheist for lack of a better term for a number of years. And then in 2019, I, I dabbled in more of the universalist spiritual type uh, practice of meditating and, you know, referring to what I would now call God as the universe and understanding that there is a being outside of this, outside of what we can see, touch, hear, and feel um, that, that plays a role in how things go. And so that was kind of my extent of it. So I became more agnostic, I guess I would say, uh, a theist maybe. Um, and then around 2020 is when I became a, a Christian again, because I, I watched a lot of the, I watched a lot of bad things really evil play out in the world over the, over the course of that year. And really to this day. Um, so the, and what really nailed, like opened my eyes to this was I was scrolling on the internet for some reason. And I found this graphic. It was a side-by-side -side of the seven deadly sins Mm. And the seven heavenly virtues, which if you don't know what the seven deadly sins are, they are greed, lust, gluttony, uh, uh, greed, lust, gluttony, envy, envy, wrath. Help me out here. Um, wrath is rage, right? Correct. Sloth, That's which is laziness. Sloth, yeah. And the seventh one, I'm, I'm going to forget it. I'm trying to keep this brief. <laughs> The seven deadly sins, and then next to them, the seven he heavenly virtues, which are just the antithesis of those seven he he deadly sins. And so I looked at these deadly sins, and I'm like, these things that I see right here, pride. I, I forgot pride. the most important one. Yeah, pride. I forgot the most important one. So I look at these sins, and I'm like, these are the exact things that I see plaguing society. I see lust, pornography. I see pride. Uh, people worshiping themselves. I see gluttony. Everyone's obese. Mm. You know, I see greed, corrupt politicians taking everything for themselves. I see these things taking place in the world. And not so coincidentally, I see all these things manifesting in my life. I was greedy with my time. I was gluttonous. Again, I bloomed up to 240 pounds. I was lustful, you know, watching pornography and all these other things. You, I saw all these things that are plaguing society and all these things that are plaguing my life. And I felt absolutely horrible mm. at the time. I'm like, all right, so there's, there's something here. There's something here. And so I just decided in that moment that, okay, what happens to my life? If I just do the opposite of these sins, if I just adopt the, the framework, the, the behavioral framework of Christianity and the rest is history because as soon as I started doing that, um, as soon as I started doing that, my life changed in a way that I can't describe. And I didn't have some mystical religious experience where I talked to God, but that alone made God real enough for me to continue to follow it. Mm, I love that. And the more, more successful people that I talk to, I know guys who are doing eight, nine figures, all of them, all of them are extremely religious. They, they mm -hmm. all take power from a greater being to be able to do what they're supposed to do. Because if you're just taking power from yourself, it's not that strong. Whereas it's like, if it's coming from God, it's a huge, huge force. So I love that. Last two questions. And these are just kind of fun. If you could pick a spirit animal, what animal would you pick? I'm going to try to not give a cliche answer because everyone wants <laughs> to say a lion or a tiger or something like that, or a wolf. Um, uh, a spirit animal. I would have to say that's really tough. Uh, I don't know, like a pit bull or something i don't know I, I, yeah like i'm very 
like I said, when I'm on, I'm on. When I'm off, I'm off. So I was trying to think of an animal that kind of has that same duality to it. Yeah. Where like, where like, and if 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 an intruder breaks in, like it's gonna it's gonna rip them to shreds. But like when it wants a treat, <laughs> it's gonna like lay on its belly and want it to be scratched. You know what I mean? I love that pitbull. If you could uh, choose one superpower, what would that be? Uh, if I could choose one superpower. You wake up tomorrow, you can do probably, one thing that's supernatural. Probably, yeah, probably teleporting. Because I hate traveling. I hate I hate taking time. That's why I, that's why like my dream is like to be to fly on private jets. Mm. Je- not not because of the luxury of it, not because it's fun, but because of how much time it saves. Like just like right. strolling onto the tarmac, getting in a plane, flying as fast as I want, getting there almost immediately, and like going and doing the thing I want to do. There's nothing I hate more than going to the air, driving 45 minutes to the airport, going through security, sitting and waiting at the gate, getting on the plane, flying at the most fuel efficient speed, landing, finding a rental car. Like I hate all that. Just give me, just give me, get me there fast. (laughs) Teleportation. I love it, dude. Thank you so much for hopping on for everybody who watched this. Tons of value, tons of first steps that you can take. If you're just going to watch this and not do anything with it and just gain more information, it's not going to help. What can you do in the next 24 hours, in the next hour, to really put everything Matt said into action and start the ball, start moving forward, snowball effect into other stuff? If someone wants to find you, reach out to you, what are you up to? Where can they reach out to you? Where's your socials? All that stuff. It is not Matt Graham on every single platform. I was going to ask you why not Matt Graham. Because Matt Graham was taken on just about every platform and not Matt Graham was available <laughs> on every single platform. Fair. Okay, there's no there's no spiritual reason to it. It was just out of convenience. Yep, it so, is it was just the availability of the username. Love it. Not Matt Graham on TikTok, on Instagram, and if they want to personally reach out to you, get coaching by you, uh, anything in there, what can they do? Not mattgram.com. Not mattgram.com. Perfect. Thank you so much for hopping on. Uh, we'll stay on for a little bit, but for everybody who is watching this, listening to this, I hope you got a ton of value. Definitely check out Matt's stuff. He's got a plethora of content that you can go through and start actually changing your life. Once again, Matt, thanks for hopping on. Appreciate you having me. Perfect.